but it won't strengthen the people who hear you I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you but in a church meeting I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language because this is how I fight my battles come on can we stand together this morning this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles and this is how I fight my battles This is how I fight. 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 It may look like I'm surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Sing it again. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Teach us how to fight. Teach us how to fight. Teach us how to fight, Lord. Teach us. Teach us how to believe. Teach us, oh God, how to declare victory and how to see victory. Teach us how to walk into victory. Teach us, oh God, how to overcome. Teach us, God, how to lose our voice. Teach us, God, how to grab a hold of this weapon and to use it against the enemy, not against each other. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers, things that bind up our minds and confuse our thinking. God, would you teach us, teach us, teach us, teach us, oh God, how to weapon the way you want us to weapon. Teach us how to release the songs, the songs that defeat hell. Teach us how to sing the songs that unlock the doors of heaven. Teach us, oh God, how to unlock the realities of the supernatural. Teach us, oh God, how to be able to walk in to the truth of your word. Because it's what we want. Lord, not what we want, but what you want. Not our will be done, but your will be done. God, that the reality of heaven would come and manifest here on earth. God, that we would lay hands on the sick and see them healed. That we would lay hands on the sick. Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has it possible? Never stop to. Because this is the sound of dry bones rattling. something new come on you're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon oh, resurrection power he runs in my veins too i believe there's another miracle here in this room this is the sound of dry bones rattling this is the praise makes a day third verse again can a cost fly the stir and soul can you feel it this morning I'm not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon the resurrection power it runs in my
yourself this morning, do you truly believe that there's anything impossible for you? We quickly say no. I know that there's nothing impossible. But then we allow the enemy to have victory. If we know there's nothing impossible for God, situations nothing's impossible amen so I want as we redo some of the course or whatever they're gonna do right here I want to put you I want you to put whatever you feel is impossible situation right out in front of you and then let God do what he does best and let him deal with that amen so as we sing this this is your prayer of faith just put whatever you feel is impossible up before God and let him do what he does come on let's do this this is what it sounds like come on this is the praise make a dead man walk again This is the praise, makes a dead 
some hope in the room today. Amen. I'm going to live again. And if we really believe the words of since when has impossible ever yeah, stopped you? Stop. Since when has impossible ever stopped him? Yeah, Come stop. on. That's why I believe in our own life and whatever else that we're facing, we need to be proactive, reaching the heart of God and reaching into the impossible. Come on. That's what we need to do. And open the grave because I'm coming out. Whatever situation you're facing, just speak to it and say, nope, it's going to open because I'm coming out. Not going to hold me in bondage anymore. Not going to bound me anymore. Sickness, disease, fear, none of it's going to hold me because I'm coming out of this because this is what it sounds like. Amen? Amen. Somebody give the Lord a good hand clap today. So I'm going to release you to go speak to each other in that same faith. Encourage one another this morning as you're talking to each other. Because, you know, sometimes we just need each other to speak life and faith. And that impossibility thing that we might be struggling with, who knows what word you have for somebody else. Take what Pastor Pete's already read. Prophesy some encouragement word to somebody. Amen. Yeah, come on. Amen. As you're doing that, don't forget to return your tithe to the storehouse to see the windows of heaven just bless your socks off. That's Jonathan's interpretations of the windows of heaven will be opened up over you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The box. lights are going to come up. Find somebody to bless. We'll be back in a few minutes.
no. Great. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I believe there's another miracle here in this room. I believe there's another miracle here in this room. Holy Spirit, help us believe there's another miracle. No, it's all good. It's good. You, you can slide him back a little if you want. Yeah. I believe there's another miracle. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Would you all just take your hands and stretch them up to heaven? Say, say this with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for your precious word. Teach me how to build my life on it, how to believe it. Teach me how to have your word released through my life. So that I see heaven here on earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, boy. Man, uh, I, I don't know if it's holy to just refer to our worship time as just ripping fun. But it was ripping fun. <laughs> That was fun. I told the band a few weeks ago, I said, uh, you, you know what, one of the greatest injustices in all of human existence is that rock and roll musicians have more fun than church musicians. I'm like, it just ought not to be that way. We're playing for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and His children. Amen. That ought to be fun. But one of the reasons that rock and roll musicians have more fun than church musicians, because the majority of the rock and roll audience is drunk. Amen. Right? But the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Which would lead me to a conclusion that's worthy of some research. That conclusion would be, if rock and roll musicians have more fun then church musicians, because their audiences are intoxicated with wine, then that would indicate that the church audience is in fact not filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's worthy some research. Well, what are you trying to do? Oh, I'm trying to get you to act like you care. And boy, you was acting like you cared this morning, you know. I mean, come on, come on now. I mean... You know, we don't need the indiscretions in the house of the Lord because we're not drunk with wine, right? We're filled with the Holy Spirit. But, boy, there ought to be some, some just enthusiasm. And, boy, it was fun this morning. Mm, mm, mm. But fun in a, in a really precious way. I believe, I believe that there were some angels up in heaven going, Ooh, you hear those guys singing down there? Come on. I don't know how many of you are tracking along in your personal devotions with uh, the Life Journal. Uh, but uh, right now we're reading through the book of Revelation and well, worship in heaven is going to be off the chain. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be lit. And whoo, the light show in heaven? Oh, we don't need any of this stuff because God's going to be like, <laughs> and you think that's white light, but it's not. Read through Revelation. John, John goes up, heaven opens, and he describes it as all the colors of the rainbow. Did you know red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple? So you really only need what? Red, yellow, and blue. All the colors are in that. It's going to be spectacular. Well, I'm looking forward to what God wants to do in the house today. You ready for the title of the message? Here it comes. 
Oh. <laughs> PTSD. I want to talk to you about PTSD this morning. Prayer, traumatic stress disorder. And that moment that happens in most of us when the preacher says, come on, lift your voices, let's pray out loud. And you're like, <laughs> and your heart starts pounding fast, blood starts running fast, and the person, the person next to you starts really going for it. And you're like, oh, that's weird. But then another person starts going for it, and you're like, man, I wish I could pray like that. I think that the concept of prayer causes much stress for the modern-day Christian, and it ought not to. Prayer is a weapon of our warfare. I mean, it's, it's something God gave to us to talk to him. But a lot of us, and I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, you know, because we're talking. Um, uh, for those of you that, that just tuned in, maybe you tuned in for the first time, um, and you're, what, what are those folks in Cedar City, Utah all about? Uh, well, we'll let you know. Uh, some of you haven't been here in a while, but you've been watching online. Others of you have never been here. Some of you haven't been here for a while just because you've been traveling, you know, school's uh, getting back. Uh, university started this last week, and so now here we are kind of kind of filling things back up again. But um, we're really believing as a congregation that the Bible's true. And some would say, oh yeah, well, you, you know, all, most all Christians believe that the Bible's true. And I think that that, as a statement, is, is true, that most people would confess that they believe it's true. But most people are hung up on whether or not they can understand it right. It's true. How many, how many of you have heard um, the, the, this statement? And I don't mean to throw any stones or point any fingers, but uh, how many of you have heard this statement? The Bible is true so long as it is interpreted correctly. Right, you've heard that statement. I want you to know the Bible is true whether you can interpret it correctly or not. Amen. The Bible, the Bible is God's word. And, and, and the, the, the one who inspired people to write it is still alive. And in the same way that he inspired people to write it, he can inspire you to believe it. And anything that's offered in faith pleases the Lord. So if you come to the word of God with an earnest desire not to get your way, but to understand his, you can't mess up. You can't get it wrong. God's word is speaking to us, and it's truth. Oh, but oftentimes our lives don't line up with it. Why? So we've been talking about specifically laying hands on the sick and seeing them healed. It's interesting that the Lord has spoken this word, and it's not just to me. I've had other people come to me with prophetic words that they've received, different words of encouragement that they've gotten, other preachers, a lot of us are feeling that this is a divine moment where God's teaching his church to rely on him and to trust in him. Amen? In ways that we never have before because we've never had to before. So it's a really, really super exciting time, right? But boy, we're, we're in a war. We're in a war. We've been in a war for a very, very long time. But for many years in our recent past, the enemy has not been quite as assertive as he seems to be right now. And so we're now, um, we've always been like, you know, kind of a little bit like, it's, it's kind of like if you think about the Revolutionary War, right? All of those homesteaders knew that there was a war going on, but it didn't come real until cannonballs started getting shot through their houses. Do you know what I'm talking about? And for many of us, We've known we're in a battle, but, you know, the gunfire hasn't been close to home. But now the gunfire is getting close to home. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And, and, and you, you know, perhaps the greatest weapon that we have is this, is this weapon of our warfare called prayer. But we don't know how to use it. We don't know how to wield it. And many of us are afraid of it. Let me, let me tell you why I think that there's some stress that goes along with prayer. Some of us, and not a few, were raised in a very um, heartless, non-personal, non-relational prayer environment where you did 
open your mouths to pray, but it didn't mean anything to you because the prayers were written by somebody else and put in a book and you just, because it was the routine of the morning, got on your knees, opened the books and recited the liturgical prayer call and response between you and the priest. Right? Many people grew up that way. That, that you can't pray to God. This is not what was taught, but this is what was, was received by many. You can't pray to God unless you pray this way or pray these words. Some others received a similar message that was more like, when you need God, you can pray to God, but here's the only prayers God really listens to. They're in this book, right? So the idea of being able to just talk to God sort of foreign to you. So, so when, when, when I say or some preacher says, hey, let's lift up our voices in prayer, your response is, where's the book? I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say. And, you know, so many of us pray for food. We do that out loud. But it's, you know... Thanks for the potatoes, thanks for the toast, thanks for the carrots, and thanks for the roast. Yay, God. Right? It's something that we recite. How many, how many of you just, just, just poke some fun at yourself? How many of you say grace for meals, but it's always the same grace? Right? You may not be honest with yourself, but the people around you are like, yeah, oh yeah, my dad. For, for me, that's the way it is. You know, I try to mix it up, you know, and actually talk to Jesus when I'm thanking him for my meals. But for the most part, you know, it always starts the same and it always ends the same. Right? Because we're, we're used to praying that way. So some of us suffer some prayer trauma because that's the way we were raised. Others of us suffer some prayer trauma because the move of the Spirit was abused by folks trying to see us filled with the power of the Spirit. What do I mean by that? Well, let me just share you my testimony. I'll share you the... the, the um, prayer trauma God's brought me through. 15 years old, I was in another church, interestingly enough, called TLC. Um, it was called the Living Church, and it was pastored by a guy named Eddie Newman, and Eddie Newman had just graduated from Rama Bible College. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Rama Bible College. Um, it is uh, the sort of standard uh, Bible school for the Word of Faith movement. And the Word of Faith movement is is the movement that challenges believers to believe God's word, to grow in their faith, and to live according to their faith. Um, absolutely fantastic arm of the body of Christ gets a bad rap and ought not to. Because let me just tell you this, this is absolutely foundational truth. Your faith will get you anything you believe God for. What we need to do, though, is learn how to use our faith to get us anything God wants. Amen? Amen. Amen. But faith is a powerful tool. Faith is strong. So Eddie Newman plants this church in Pine Top Lakeside, Arizona. Anybody know where Pine Top Lakeside is? Yeah, grew up there. That's where I learned to snow ski up at Sunrise Ski Resort. And uh, Eddie Newman came, and, and boy, this was really my first experience in a really powerful, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit evidence by speaking in tongues when I was 11 years old at a Calvary Chapel church, which interestingly enough, don't tell anybody because the Calvary Chapel folks don't want you to know that they pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit and evidence speaking tongues, but it's true. That's where it happened for me, right? Right, but, but I didn't really begin to have a robust prayer life then. It wasn't until I was 15 years old, start going to the living church. And I still remember the day. Uh, it was a Bible study in a living room, and, and they asked me if I'd ever received the gift of tongues, and I thought I had, but I wasn't sure I had because I didn't pray frequently in tongues. I was a 15-year-old kid, right? And they're like, they're like, well, do you, do you pray in tongues? And I'm like, well, do you want to pray in tongues? Yes, I do. So all these old ladies. How many of you know old ladies can pray like no one else can pray? I mean, you want to learn how to pray, get around some old ladies filled with the Spirit. Yeah. I mean, so all these ladies, they stand around me. And they're going, and I'm like, oh, 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 oh. I'm getting attacked by these old ladies filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you start feeling stuff. And you're like, is that you, Lord, or is that the old ladies? What is that? It smells like mothballs and everything. Now, this was, listen, the reason you laughed is because you know what I meant, right? So don't hold that against me, right? But, but, but that, was, that was in the 80s. It's not the same today. How many, 
How many of you were around some old ladies in the 80s that smelled like mothballs? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, see, I'm not the only one. But there I am. There I am, and they're, they're going for it, and, and I'm like, And no joke, they said this to me. They said, well, just begin to say what you hear us saying. So I did. So I started going, ha ba 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 And they're like, ah, oh, you received it. Praise the Lord. Big hugs. Celebrate with grape juice. <laughs> and so then we leave. And I didn't know, even know that I was traumatized until after Cammie and I had gotten married. And I'd been through Bible college at this time. I was licensed and ordained with the Assemblies of God. One of the 16 fundamental truths of the Assemblies of God is that praying in tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So in the Assemblies of God, there is a tendency, which we already read the converse, right? Seek the word of prophecy more than that you would speak in tongues. Problem with prophecy is... Uh, we don't have a way of evaluating whether or not that was prophetic. So in the assemblies of God, there's a tendency to push people towards speaking in tongues. And the issue with that is that people who don't begin to speak in tongues feel like they didn't receive. And so that's something that, that the assemblies of God and the general council, the assemblies of God and the district councils are constantly working through. Because we do believe, from a biblical standpoint, even the four square church would agree that the baptism of a Holy Spirit, the initial physical evidence of that is speaking in tongues. That doesn't mean that if you don't speak in tongues that you don't have the Holy Spirit. It just means that there's not some physical evidence where someone can go, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. But don't get me wrong, just because somebody is shunned to Lakai and Hoba Babobolin doesn't mean that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Because right? I could do this. I could go, everybody say, ho ba 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 bo See, that, that, that wasn't the Spirit. That was Pete. <laughs> right? Right? Fred Flintstone. Yabba dabba do. Right? I mean, I mean you, you know what I'm talking about? This is, this is traumatic. When you're really seeking God. When you're really going for God and you want everything from God. And you find that stuff happening. So Cam and I get married. I was licensed Assemblies of God at the time. And, and I'd gone back to uh, Loomis First Assembly of God Church because uh, they were having a baby shower for Hannah. And I was going to be a good dad. Any of you early dads, hear me. I was going to be a good dad. I was going to go to the baby shower. I spent two minutes in that baby shower. I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sticking around for this. I mean, women putting their faces in diapers with melted chocolate in there, and they gotta, they got to look at it and taste it, and they take pictures, and then they, 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 they suck juice out of baby bottles and pass around numbers, and I'm like, nah, nah, I'm out. <laughs> Smells like mothballs in here. <laughs> so so at, that, at that time, Cammie and I were going through some pretty difficult stuff, and I needed the Lord. And Lewis First Assembly of God Church will always be for me, the place that I truly fell in love with Jesus. I grew up knowing a lot about him, wanted to serve him, was enlisted in his army. Um, Cammie's dad um, sent me to Brownsville. Brownsville's the place that I fell in love with Jesus, and my relationship with Jesus grew and was forged at Loomis First Assembly. I'm not the only one. But they were in this baby shower, and I went out, and I needed God. I needed an answer from God. And this is not biblical, what I'm going to tell you. This is just my testimony. But a man with a testimony is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And I believe there's another miracle here in this room, and nothing is impossible for God. Right? But this story that I'm going to tell you, you can't have. Right? This is between me and Jesus. This is not between you and Jesus. I'm just telling you what happened to me. All right? So you can't tell me that wasn't God. You can't come up with a theology that says, oh, that's not how God works, because that's how God worked in me. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what happened is, I'm out in Loomis, and Loomis had, beaut- any, anybody knows that part of the, uh, that part of the country, it's the, it's the western foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains, and it's right, Loomis is right where the mountains meet the valley, the Sacramento Valley, and big, big granite outcroppings. If you think of Yosemite, um, but smaller, big granite rocks, almost look like granite structures, and giant oak trees, and lots of green grass. It's very humid there, and shrubs and bushes. And Loomis First Assembly had these beautiful, beautiful grounds around it. 
um, they, they had an a- outdoor baptismal all set in the rocks, and the water flowed down off the rocks and into the baptismal font. And I mean, it was just a fabulous place. And the girls are all in having their bridal shower, and I'm out praying, and I'm praying in the prayer language that I received from those ladies. And I can remember telling the Lord, Lord, this isn't good enough. I don't know whether this prayer language that I'm praying to you in is from you. I don't know if I received it from you or if I'm just consciously or subconsciously mimicking what those ladies did. And I said, so Lord, I don't have any biblical evidence, but I need you to baptize me new. And I need you to give me a different prayer language. And he did. In the grounds of Lumis First Assembly. Oh, I felt the Holy Spirit and I just started getting lost in a prayer language that didn't need to be interrupted because none or didn't need to be interpreted because none of you were there. <laughs> Building myself up, right? In my most holy faith. But I think that there's some people in the room today. You've suffered some trauma when it comes to the idea of speaking in tongues. Maybe you've come to the altar. And you've been prayed over and haven't received the gift of the Spirit. I won't ask for a show of hands, but you know who you are. You're like, yeah, I want to speak in tongues. But I came to the altar and they prayed over me and nothing happened. As I was praying about this this week, I thought, we, we, we have a target today that we're going to hit. Um, one of the issues that we have with speaking in tongues is that we don't pray in English out loud. And because we don't pray, let me, let me ask you this question. If you are one who is unable to, in the corporate setting of believers, boldly open your mouth and articulate prayers in your own language, why would you ever think that you would trust yourself to do that in an unknown language? Does that make sense? I mean, I mean, you know, you, may, maybe you did get filled with the Spirit evidenced by speaking in tongues. You just won't open your mouth. Right? Right? So we need to loose the tongue. One of the ways we're going to get over this PTSD is by opening our mouths and exercising prayer. And doing that corporately, I'll give you some, some Bible verses and some reasons, and then we'll have a time of prayer uh, this afternoon. Uh, or this afternoon, that was prophetic. <laughs> uh, some of us um, have PTSD um, because we don't really understand how to go about it and how long to spend. And we grew up in Grandma's church. Well, this ain't your Grandma's church, right? <laughs> right? Uh, this is this is uh, your Grandma's church, Jordan. And it's your grandma's church, Bubba. Uh, but for most of y'all, this isn't your grandma's church, right? But you grew up, you know, you know what I mean by your grandma's church? You, you grew up with the preacher saying, Jesus told his disciples, can you not tarry one hour? And you grew up feeling like, if I'm going to pray, i got to spend an hour in prayer. There was a, there was a, a pastor um, in the late 80s, early 90s called Larry Lee that wrote a book called Could You Not Tarry? And it was all about discovering the joy in prayer. And the big challenge was to take 30 days to pray for an hour. Listen, friend, ain't nobody got time for that. Now, if if you're the kind of person, if you're the kind of person that prays for an hour, you have a very, very special gift. And, And don't waste that gift. Whatever it is God's revealing to you, in those times, because there are people that God has called to a lifestyle of that type of prayer. But most of us can't carve out an hour to pray. Most of us don't have um, the intellectual focus to pray for an hour. Which can I tell you? Jesus changed the world with his disciples. But where that comes from is in their massive failure to do it. Hello? The, the question is this. Why are you sleeping? Could you not tarry one hour? So Jesus never even asked them to pray for an hour. 
But some of us have this trauma because we don't recognize that a 10-second prayer or a 30-second prayer or a two-minute prayer or a prayerful thought has as much impact as an hour of prayer. Jesus made it very clear that long, intimidating prayers don't move the heart of God. But simple ones do. Simple ones do. So, what about this open your mouth thing? We talked a couple of weeks ago about uh, Peter and John getting arrested and coming back and telling all the believers. And all the believers were gathered together. And in Acts chapter 4, it says, When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. They all lifted their voices in prayer to God. I want to tell you just a couple of things that just make sense to me. And I want to see if it resonates with you and makes sense to you. Look around the room. Don't count how many people you suppose are in the room right now. 100? 75? 80? Well, who cares what the number is? But every person in the room has the ability right now to make a request from heaven. Right? So let me ask you this. If I pray, does God hear me? Yes. Yes, he does. If Anna prays, does God hear her? Yes. If Jean prays, does God hear him? If Anand prays, does God hear him? Yeah. If Ryan prays, does God hear him? We can go all around the room. Right. How many of you believe that God hears you when you pray? Right? Right? Okay. Oh, my goodness. But what happens if we're all at our own houses, and at the same moment, we all pray? Does God still hear all of us? Oh, really? Really? He does, doesn't he? Doesn't he? So how many different prayer requests, if we're all at home and we all pray at the very same moment, can God hear us all? Yes. And then there is that many different requests being made of the Lord and being made of heaven at the very same time. Do you understand what I'm saying? What happens if we all prayed at the very same time about the very same thing? Whoo! Then our request of heaven is being exponentially multiplied by that many people. Does that make sense? Well, now let's take everybody from our homes. And let's bring them all here. In the same room now at the same time. Can God still hear all of us? He can? Wow. Unbelievable. He could still hear all of us? At the same time? Why is it that we've grown into a culture of agreeing with an individual praying while we just all say amen. Rather than as a corporate group of people lifting our voices and releasing the voices of the saints. See, here's what happens. You, de depending on your theology and how you interpret things, the devil may or may not be able to um, know and hear your thoughts. There are some that say he can, there are some that say he um, I don't care whether he knows my thoughts. I want him to hear my voice. And there's something powerful about you hearing your own voice. Something very powerful about you hearing your own voice. Think about war. We've been talking about war. Here's what the Bible says. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Um, th this is the Apostle Paul getting ready to introduce the concept of uh, um, the armor of God. He says, well, well, first let me tell you, uh, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So, put on the helmet of salvation, gird up your waist with the belt of truth, 
take up the, the, the shield of faith, the, you, you know, and on and on the, the list goes. So then, take me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is Paul's teaching. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the next verse. I can just read it to you. It says, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly ones. Use God's mighty weapons, not worldly ones. Notice what he says to knock down. To knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. How do we do that? We do that through prayer. Okay? So, imagine that we actually are all engaged in this battle. Imagine for a moment that the great apostle Paul actually knew something. Huh? Imagine. And we actually are fighting a war. But we're not fighting it against stuff we see. How are we going to fight it? We're going to fight it through prayer. Right? But picture war. Picture war in your mind prior to World War I. Picture war prior to World War I. The reason I say prior to World War I is because World War I sort of marks the big global war where technology starts to be a weapon of warfare. Right? We start seeing things like tanks and, and airplanes and and that kind of stuff. Prior to World War I, wars were fought hand to hand combat, guns. What does that picture look like in your mind? It's not a person out by himself fighting a war. And a congregation going, you got this. Go for it. We're behind you. Amen. I was like, ooh. Did you, did you see that move? Hmm. Certainly wasn't a congregation going, I can't believe he chose that weapon. I'm going to go find myself a different warrior. Somebody that fights with this weapon. Uh, that's not the way war happens. If we are truly engaged in a war, which I believe we are, that means that we've got to fight together. I should have brought the video clip. I was flipping through the channels the other day, and I came across a scene it was the end of the movie The Patriot. Anybody seen that? Come against this scene, and there's Mel Gibson just getting the life beat out of him. I can't even remember what the character's name is in the movie. But he's getting the life beat out of him. And he's getting ready to get killed. And he sees the American, the ratty, torn American flag. Right? Sees it just coming across. You know, they're, 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 they're pushing the line forward. And then the army starts getting beat, and they, they're pushing the army back. And the American flag begins to retreat. And Mel Gibson's there on his knees. I thought this was so funny. He's sitting there on his knees getting ready to die, and he sees his front line faltering. How many of you are familiar with the movie? He sees the front line faltering. And as the flag goes by him, he looks at those embarrassed, slaughtered, defeated soldiers, and he goes... I'll be praying for you. Well, no, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. What did he do? He killed the guy that was about ready to kill him. He grabs that flag and he goes running up the hill going, hold the line, hold the line, hold the line for a free nation. 
For a free nation, that's what people gave their lives for. For a free nation, men and women took up arms to kill people and to be killed so that you and I could live in a free nation. But the Christian church has come to a place where we don't know how to fight. We're not willing to fight. We're not willing to put our lives on the line. We're not willing to let people die. We're not willing to die ourselves for the sake of keeping face and for the sake of being popular. We're not willing to lift up a voice in prayer because we're embarrassed because we're suffering from prayer, traumatic stress disorder. And the Lord Jesus wants to set us free today. He wants us to hold the line. He wants us to care. He wants us to have each other's backs. He wants us to be a people who will say, not only hold the line, but who will grab the flag and inspire other people to not give up to hold the line, to keep going. And this thing about, I'll be praying for you, has got to go. Instead of saying, I'll be praying for you, how about this? Jesus, in your name right now, intervene on behalf of the troubled. Amen? We were at the Meet Your Religious Leader Food and Faith Barbecue on Wednesday night, and I came over to Jerry Van Iwarden, And I said, hey, I heard a rumor that Emma's sick. How's she doing? And he told me she's in the hospital. She's fighting COVID. So I put my hand on Jerry's shoulder and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and we declare that it was you who breathed life into us and that this virus which is coming to attack the lungs, this virus that has come to take the life that you've breathed into us, we claim victory in Jesus' name. Right there on the street with everybody standing around. I started just praying with my hand and Jerry's like, yes, yes, doing the Jerry Van I Warden thing. He's like, that's right. I agree with you, brother. And we're just like, I'm like, come on. Does this stuff mean anything to us or not? Or are you just okay with having your spiritual butt handed to you day after day after day after day after day? Or are we gonna learn how to take the weapons of our warfare? Two stories. And then we're going to pray. Band, I'm going to invite you to come back up if you would. Two stories. One of them. It's one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. It's Elijah and the prophets of Baal, the war. Do you remember this? Do you remember this story, right? Where where Elijah's like, okay, we're going to settle this for all time. Oh, come on. They get up on the top of Mount Carmel. There's 400 prophets of Baal. 400 prophets of Baal. One prophet of God. And Elijah's like, all right, here's the deal, boys. You build an altar, I'm going to build an altar. You set your altar up, put a bull on it. I'll set an altar up, put a bull on it. And the God who answers by fire, we'll know that God's the true God. But this is in 1 Kings chapter 18. You can look it up if you want. <laughs> and the prophets of Baal, they get this bull and they work themselves into all kinds of frenzy. I'm not talking about getting in a frenzy. Frenzy for the sake of frenzy doesn't produce anything. So the prophets of Baal get themselves in a frenzy and, and, and Elijah starts to mock them. <laughs> and he's like, hey, well, maybe you need to yell out or your God might be going to the bathroom. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> maybe your God's taking care of some personal business. You need to interrupt him. I don't know. <laughs> anyways, anyways. So then nothing happens. So he's like, all right, it's my turn. And he orders them to dig ditches around him and to just douse and soak the offering with water and the wood. It's all covered in water. And then this is what the Bible says. It says that Elijah lifted up his voice in prayer and said, oh God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, answer me today so that these people will know that you are God. And I don't think he went, oh, God, 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 if you're really real, God, please. No, 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 no. What what did Elijah do? He knew God. So he's made some demands of God. He made some demands of heaven because of a relationship that he had with God. And he said, God, you answer today. You answer right now. Friends, it's time that you and I learn how to make some demands of heaven. It's time that you and I learn how to lift our voices, how to say some things, 
Second story is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I love this story. You love this story too. This is the story where Jesus takes his disciples into the garden. And this is the story where he says, could you not tarry one hour? This is the story where the Bible says that Jesus prayed. And when Jesus prayed, you know what he prayed for? He prayed for deliverance. He said, God, is there any way? Is there any way that I can not go through this? Is there any way? Is there any option other than this? And then he says, nevertheless, your will be done, not my will. Come on. Interesting point of that story, that if you're not looking for it, you'll miss it, is that the Luke, who is the, the doctor, the physician, the one who wrote more than half of the New Testament. Did you know that the book of Luke combined with the book of Acts, which was also written by Luke, equal more than any other Bible author than Moses? But the physician Luke is the one that tells us he was so agonized in that garden that day that the blood literally burst forth from his forehead and he sweat drops of blood. That doesn't sound to me like a, oh God, you know, really, I was just hoping that there was a way that we could get through this. No, 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 no. How do we know? Because here's the descriptor. Luke tells us that Jesus went a stone's throw away from his disciples. Why is that significant? Well, because somebody wrote down what he prayed. Huh? Uh, tell me, how far is the stone's throw? Well, it's past that door even if I threw it. <laughs> My rotator cuff's gone. I can't throw very far, but I could hit that exit sign. I mean, we're, we're talking potentially the front door of the church. We're, we're, we're talking potentially 100, 150 feet away. And somebody heard him. Somebody heard him. Which means Jesus time that he needed the most like the believers in Acts chapter 4 lifted up his voice in prayer something we need to learn to do if we're going to see the move of God the way we're asking God to move we need to become a people of prayer not a people of quiet subdued prayer but a people who know how to exercise this weapon going back to the movie analogies back to the weapons analogies how many movies have you seen where the warriors like like in what's that tom cruise movie the Sam, the last samurai right when he's living with the samurai and they're out and they're all practicing right they're all there they're all battling and then when it comes time to fight listen if we don't practice praying together we're never going to learn how to pray on our own we're here right now this morning gathered together all of us and we're going to learn how to practice come on let's stand up this morning we're gonna start, gonna start, gonna start, gonna start by helping you. Let's raise a hallelujah in the presence of our enemies. This is how we're gonna start. Come on. Let's raise a hallelujah. It's louder than. Before we sing that line again, before we sing that line again, I want you to pay attention to We sing that we love this song. But it's time to take this song from a worship setting in a church to a training camp. It's time to take this song as more than just a cool moment in our church service. But it's time to take this song and say, this is how I'm going to begin to learn to fight my battles. This is how I'm going to learn to exercise the weapons of our warfare. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. In the presence of my enemies. Pay attention to the next line. Come on. I'll raise a hallelujah.
Revolutionary War, they had drums and fifes. Do you know why? Because m- music, whether you're a musician or not, music gives you courage. Any football fans, baseball fans, basketball fans, NASCAR fans, music gives you courage. As the music play, I'm going to ask you, come on, let's practice. Would you begin right now to verbalize your request to heaven? Come on, just go ahead all around the room. Lift up your voices and let's pray. trying to get everybody worked up. It's not something. But we're going to let the music build and we're going to get you to sing a little louder. Why? Well, there's a few reasons and I don't have time anymore to go into all the biblical reasons. But I just want you to know hell is listening to you. And hell is going, oh no. No. Those Cedar City folk, they're They're turning it up. 
they're turning hell hell is right now going that was one of our strongholds for the last 200 years what's going on well the people of god are finding their voice how many of you heard that little colloquialism hey you got to find your voice gavin you got to find your voice jonathan you found your voice you got to find your voice you got to find your voice well that church in cedar city boy they're finding their voice Ooh, yeah. all right come on can you sing a little louder sing a little louder can you sing a little louder Can you sing a little louder? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Can you sing a little louder? Oh, sing a little louder. Let's do it again. Can you sing a little louder in the presence? Can you sing a little louder? Louder than the unbelief. Can you sing a little louder? Oh, my weapon is a melody. Can you sing? This would be the place where I pray to dismiss you. But what I want is for us all to pray out loud as we are dismissed. Now, this is the time where we get to take all hundred of us and make the same request together. All right. But we're going to do it in such a way that heaven hears us. So it's not heaven hearing me and you agreeing with that. Heaven's up there agreeing already. Okay, so we're going to make this same request together. And here's what that request is. And then you can pray about it however you want to. But the request is that we would take this passion, this energy, and this enthusiasm with us as we leave. Right? Because when, when you leave, the enemy is going to get loud. And you got to get louder. When you leave, the unbelief is going to get loud, but you got to get louder. Some of you believe God for great things and been let down. So now there's a lack of faith. When that unbelief comes, you got to get louder than it. That's what this song says. So when we pray, let's pray out loud and let's pray that we'll take this moment right now with us throughout the week that will leave this place filled with the Spirit of God, that will leave this place knowing to a greater degree how to lift our voices in prayer and how to exercise that weapon. Are you ready? Go. Give the Lord a shout of praise this morning, would you? Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you. 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 And I love you. We'll see you next Sunday.